Good morning. Now, I, I appreciate you being here. Today, we're, I am dressed casually. It's the one day a year I don't wear a tie to church uh, for BBS. So, again, to speak of BBS, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody. This week, we're going to continue with discussing how the Old Testament points to Jesus. And in this case, we're talking about the plague. So, this week is about frogs and dust. And you might be surprised that that actually helps point toward Jesus, but I'll tell you, the Old Testament's all about getting the word out about the, the joy that God has for the firstborn, and he sent his firstborn for us, and the joy that he has in being in fellowship with us, and blessing us through his firstborn, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of that salvation through him. So we'll eventually, or soon, be in Exodus, but today's trivia question is, you know, when we think about idol worship, evil kings and, and such of Israel, I think a lot of us think of Ahab and Jezebel. So who was Ahab's father? And that is today's trivia question. We've been more oriented to the lesson to ask who was Jezebel's father, but I've asked you that before and everybody knows that answer. So who was Ahab's father? And then we'll go back and talk about the plagues. If anybody happens just know, that's fine. But you can look it up because it's in the Bible. King Omri. Omri. King Omri was his father. So let's look real quick at 1 Kings 16. You can find it in a few places, honestly. But we'll pick the 1 Kings 16 one. Um, and we're going to look at first, 1 Kings 16, 25. Tell you, I keep trying to find an angle that the Bible isn't clean. You know how they rub down baseballs? to keep them from being slick in Major League Baseball. I was reading about that this week. I need to rub down my Bible a little bit so it's not too slippery I'll get you looking, to too shiny. Mind. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, 1 Kings 16, 25. Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. He walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, son Nebat, and in his sin, which, caused, which he had caused Israel to commit. So they provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their worthless idols. Verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, who was a pretty good king, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Remember, his father just had that said about him, and now it's said of him too. Um, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. So notice that that was that his wife, Jezebel, famously a rather wicked woman, was the king of Ethbaal, of the Sidonians and so lots of worship of false gods involved there and that's what we've been talking about of course in, back in the plague so let's go back now to Exodus and we'll talk about I barely mentioned last week the plague of the frogs so we're going to really start there so let's turn to uh, Exodus 7 let me find that oh excuse me yeah 7 25, end of seven, survey. Exodus. So we talked about the, uh, the father of Egypt was considered to be Hopi. Happy is probably, possibly, how it's pronounced, H-A-P-I. Uh, and he was the god of the River Nile. And the River Nile became blood-filled based on the first plague because God struck at the first false god of Egypt uh, initially. And so... The, the highest false god of Egypt. So the king of Egypt, who at this time uh, was, um, I mentioned it last week, I gotta remember it real quick. Which pharaoh was this? Oh goodness, I have a note somewhere. Sorry, I forgot the name suddenly when I was about to say it. The father of Ramesses was, I don't remember the father. Yeah, but it's, um, oh man. I, it doesn't really matter, honestly. That's more <laughs> historical, but it drives me nuts when I can't think of something. Um, so the, uh, the, the king of Pharaoh at this time, though, was felt, every king of Pharaoh, 
every king of Pharaoh. Oh man, that's <laughs> oh that's like saying it's a every t-shirt. sweet fruity portion. Yeah, it, exactly. Every sweet portion of jelly is uh, you know, something. So anyway, the uh, uh, this was King Titmus. That was it of uh, Egypt. The, probably Titmus the second, and. Um, so every though Pharaoh was considered to be a son of Happy, the god of Egypt. So God uh, struck against Pharaoh's father first, if you think of it that way. And then, of course, at the 10th plague, he struck against his son. And I think that speaks to the way there so often is symmetry in Scripture. Hebrew Scripture in particular very frequently has a prelude and then at the end the epilogue and in between all the stories that make that fit and usually peak right at the middle or at least had the bookcase ends and in this case it was the father of pharaoh was struck and then the son of pharaoh pharaoh was struck so i think that's always an interesting thing to keep in mind the way god works too so if we now look at the uh at verse chapter Seven verse 25 seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile so we had talked about that last week refer back to last week if you want to if you missed it so then verse 1 chapter 8 then the Lord said to him this is what the Lord says let my people go so they may worship me if you refuse to let them go I will plague your whole country with frogs now just to back up the goddess of fertility uh, which encompass human fertility water fertility and uh, plant life, the fertile, like wheat, grains, all the things you would think about that they would store up, for instance, that they stored up during the days of the famine, or had stored up so that Egypt was able to supply the world's food during the famine. They initially brought Joseph, Joseph's family to Joseph. The interpretation of Joseph's, uh, or the interpretation, excuse me, of Pharaoh's dream that Joseph did. And so the, the goddess was Hecate, or it's, which is spelled usually H-E-K-E-T. Sometimes it's H-E-Q-A. Sometimes it's H-E-Q-E-T. Sometimes it's H-E-Q-T-A. Uh, and sometimes it's H-E-Q-T-I-T, which is sort of a strange version of it too. But anyway, of all those, Hecate is what I'll refer to her as. So when Hecate is... Um, symbolized in hieroglyphics that can be found to this day she is portrayed usually as a pregnant woman near grain holding grain and having the head of a frog and that was because the Egyptians felt that when frogs came from the Nile uh, that that was the time of extreme fertility and so they worshipped this goddess of Egypt Hecate who was portrayed as a frog you and I find that a little odd because we don't do things like that in a literal sense. We may do that up here, but we don't do it literally. We don't tend to make, I hope. If you are making statues, drawings, and idols at home, please come speak to me after and we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that. But uh, <laughs> we don't tend to do that literally, but the Egyptians were big on imagery and on uh, having that uh, image readily available in their history and in their worship and so keep me in mind that she had the head of a frog so the Nile will team with frogs chapter 8 verse 3 what would you think could be a little strange about that now there are always frogs and I'll tell you that what you're thinking is that you're thinking well the Nile just had blood in it killing out the fish and it probably killed out you know the tadpoles and so it was a, also an unexpected issue that the Nile had blood in it and death that the frogs came. And they came at the order, of course, of God. And so the Nile will team with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will go upon you and your people and all your officials. Okay, so let's think about that for a second. I touched on this last week, but I think it's important to emphasize more. Is that if, if we picture, you know, probably the most euphemistic thing about a mating of humans is the bed, right? We talk about the marriage bed. We talk about the master bedroom. 
we talk about sleeping together euphemistically, and all those things pertain to fertility of the human. And so if the frogs are in the bedroom and on your bed, that is striking against that fertility issue of the frog. If the frog then becomes so numerous and so overwhelming that you can't even lay on your bed, presumably, that they'd be everywhere, then I think that is why he specifically said they'll be in the palace, first of all, they'll hit fair on this family, they'll be on your bed, the houses of your officials and on your people, in your ovens. That's another issue of the fertility, the food, the fact that they had grain to eat and whatever food they would bake, if your oven was full of frogs, that's a big issue, you know, striking against, showing who's really in charge. Was it this goddess who wanted fertility and to be out of the way of it, presumably, or is it God in charge? I'm gonna mention one more thing about that here in a second. And your kneading troughs, and we talked a little bit last week too, that if you're trying to work your grain into a dough to bake it, and that, that trough is full of frogs, that's going to be a difficult deal, a very difficult issue. Now, here's the other thing that's not specifically found in Exodus, but is found in history, which I think is really interesting, and that is that the Egyptians were forbidden from killing frogs because this was a goddess of, of Egypt. So if you could not kill the frog that's in your bed, your oven, your kneading trough, you can't do anything, you know? It really goes against the theoretical power of the frog, of the goddess Hecate, to say that they were so over, overwhelming, they were everywhere, and then the Egyptians couldn't function. They could not kill a frog. They were not to hurt or displace a frog. And, you know, ordinarily, if there were, let's say, a volume of 12 frogs per person of population, you know, I'm guessing this went up to hundreds per person of population. And so I think it's an interesting aspect of this attack with the plague that he specifically says bed, oven, kneading trough, and of course, all over the people too. What would you do if you were swarmed with frogs and you couldn't hurt a frog? Could you step somewhere? Probably not. You know, could you clear them out from all over your face? Probably you shouldn't, because they could fall away and be hurt. I think it's a really interesting aspect of this plague. You know, when you think about it as a kid, you think, oh, frogs everywhere, that's silly. And it, you know, it seems like it, but this was very directed spiritually. Uh, so frogs will go upon your people and your officials. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come out of the come up on the land of Egypt. Excuse me, I don't know how I got it out of. Come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Just think about that for a minute. Last week we talked about the magicians could reproduce the, the blood in the water, but yet all the water, even cancer's water, is full of blood. So, you know, to me, it's not that hard to make it look like, oh, you know, here's a clear vat of water. You know, let's say I, I said, this is a clear vat of water, it's perfectly fine, and here I'll pour it out, it's gonna look like blood. And it, of course, was already blood, right? So either they did this by basically telling people, here is how it's done, and lying to them, or they actually had some degree of power from the false god uh, and, you know, I'll put that past the false god issue because God warns us to steer away from false gods. There must be a reason. If they don't exist, there's not really a reason to steer away from them, right? To avoid them entirely. So I don't know if it was that they really made, like, you know, maybe cleared out a spot and made a frog appear there. Well, I guess that's possible. But I think if frogs were everywhere, it's really easy to say, as a pharaoh's edict, Oh, you know, the magicians can do this too, and because they're everywhere anyway. So if, if one way or the other, it is of note that both the blood in the river and the frogs uh, all over the people, the ovens, the beds, the kneading trough, and the officials, both were reproduced by magicians, because in the next plague, we'll read a little differently. Well, excuse me while I have a little drink of this blood. <laughs> I hope we don't start bleeding. Uh, I hope not. You know, that would be... That would be a unique 
aspect of class. The um, I think I think that coffee is well. We went through the many benefits health wise of coffee, but uh, it is healthy for you. Don't be afraid if you drink coffee. It's a, a God given plant. All right. So um, then, as we go down, though, that he summoned these officials. Uh, and they made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Verse 8, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord take away, to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I'll let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Okay, let's talk about that real briefly too because I think that's an important little phrase in there, and that is that God was called into this by Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh brought them in. He didn't say, Moses and Aaron, get rid of these frogs. He said, pray to your God that he'll get rid of these frogs. So it strikes me that Pharaoh was aware of where these frogs came from. The fact that Moses and Aaron were telling him a true uh, real, or a true story as to why the frogs are there. And of course, you know, of all the people in Egypt who maybe knew that the magicians were either in obedience to false gods or were fake and knew that he wasn't really the son of happy the god of egypt and knew that of all the power in egypt it really was that he wielded power in egypt it wasn't really the goddess coming up out of the river in the form of a frog you know it's interesting to me that he probably knew full well he didn't have power to overcome this and so he called in moses Aaron and said pray to your god pray to the lord to take the frogs away from me and my people and I'll let you go to offer sacrifices, Lord. And of course, we know the whole difficult issue of hardening of the heart, why he wouldn't, you know, obey, and all those things. I'll go into one more aspect of that in just a second. Yes? John, did you notice that there's a caveat to what Pharaoh said? That he didn't say he was going to let them go. Right. Period. This new paragraph is, I'll let you go to go off and sacrifice. Yes. Now, that doesn't, that sounds like to me, okay, I'm going to give you all a day off. Right. Uh, or two. Uh, to go out and do your do your sacrifice to your God, but then when you're finished, you're going to be coming back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Excellent point. So it still wasn't freedom. It still wasn't fully yielding to God, and I think that's a real key point, is that he wanted the frogs gone. He didn't want to say, you know, God is God. I will yield to him. Notice back in chapter 7, verse 2, uh, God was talking to uh, Moses about how he be like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron be your prophet. That's verse one. Then you are to say everything I command you and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. So that was one aspect of, you know, sort of the easing into freeing the people was let, them go, let the people go out of the country. And we know from all the numbers, the volume of it, it'd be really a challenge to have them leave and come back. And, you know, it also speaks to the issue of what slavery was, which was all-time, full-time consigned work that, you know, was, this was not, like you said, a holiday from them. And so it wasn't to be. But there was this little compromising comment, uh, they can go offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, verse 9, I leave you, I leave to you, excuse me, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, Moses replied, it'll be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people and will, will remain only in the Nile. So I think that's a very interesting aspect too that we maybe kind of have glossed over through the years is that they literally said, now you name the time and we'll show you that God's in charge. If he had said, oh, the frogs will fade away, you know, they'll eventually die and fade away and you won't have to worry about it. And then maybe over five, seven days, they'll be mostly gone. He said, you name the time and they will leave you alone. And, you know, it presumably, and I believe by faith, uh, that if, if Pharaoh, for whatever reason, said, make it happen immediately, or if he had said, well, in a week, you know, or whatever, but he said tomorrow. So it will be as you say, and Moses had said. So verse 12, now Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh. Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. 
They were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart, would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Okay, so let's think about that for a minute, too, is that they didn't just go away. They died, which would be, again, speaking against the power of the goddess who was a frog. If she had real power, why would she have her representatives all dead out there all at once? which I think is shockingly remarkable too. And then they piled up and were a stench. <coughs> you know, it's interesting as well that if you ever have believed in something or think something would come true and it doesn't, it's amazing how much it becomes sort of a point of uh, distress for you. You know, I might even suggest there's a little bit of that I think when people have a job and they leave that job and they almost like burn all the bridges so it seems like that was the worst job in the world they could ever have had even though it was good for a long time, but they kind of like, you know, make it out to be awful so that they can psychologically sort of depart from that and then say, oh, I'm so glad I'm leaving this sorry place. Granted, it was fine for 21 years, three months, four days, but it's awful now. <laughs> you know, and and I think it's interesting that, that people psychologically kind of tend to do that. And that's how I view this, is they love the frog. Now they've come to hate the frog because it sinks. It, it got all over everything, messed everything up, and then there are dead piles of it that they couldn't even know what to do with. And that speaks against the power of a goddess, and God, Jehovah God, is so much greater. So let's move into this uh, plague of gnats. I should introduce first the next god that's being attacked, which is the god Geb, is what I'll call him, which is G-E-B. Uh, what does yeah, Miss speak? Maybe I misspoke. The gnats from the dust. Yeah, gnats from dust or little thingos. Yes. Sure. Yes. Since they worshipped the gods and couldn't harm them in any way, what did they normally do when they brought that? Well, that's a good question. Her question is, since they worshipped frogs and couldn't harm them, what did they normally do when they died? And I think the answer is probably just that once it was dead, it was. You know, they could probably dispose of it. I mean, apparently they could pile them into piles. But I think when there aren't an overwhelming number, you don't necessarily have to worry about the natural death. I think this was the supernatural death all at once that they had to deal with. And uh, so if they didn't kill them, I'm going to say, if presume they could dispose of them. But I think that if they killed them, they would be found guilty under Egyptian law. Interesting question, though. I haven't really thought about that. But again, if it's, you know, usually 0.03% of what the frogs were, it's much less to deal with so than what they had. All right. Oh, so I was mentioning this. You can, if you want, you can go home and talk about this God and pronounce it Jeb. I'm going to call him Geb. It's G-E-B. And he is considered the God of the earth and of dust. Now, going back to why people have false gods, remember that we talked about the reason there often are uh, false gods in communities of people and they develop this sort of broad system you know there's sun moon and stars there's water storm and river and flood and tide and there's fertility for the human the plant the animal the livestock and there's you know there are all these things that influence them in a way if they live near a volcano they'd make a false god to the volcano because they are presumably under control of that factor and can't control it so they want to have a way to worship it so they can feel like they're bringing influence so you could say to the volcano next to you that's starting to roll a lava down you could say look we'll we'll sacrifice to you if you'll just divert that lava over to our enemy instead of here and so though that's kind of how false gods come about and so this one you might wonder about the false god or the god for dust and I think it's because they had tremendously large amounts of dust in Egypt. You know, it's a, an incredibly barren place, only fertile in the area where the Nile waters the, the land, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that that surge from the Nile brings some degree of nutrition and life to the area near the Nile. And if you look even today at a map, sort of a sky view or whatever, you can see Egypt is barren desert, extremely dry, windy, dusty, nothing living there except the, the people going through on behind camels to hide from the sand when they need to. And, and then up next to the river, there's this fertile zone where the water flooded and then receded and they can plant and try to live off of that each year. And so 
the god of the dust would presumably be you know we we want to sacrifice to this one to keep from having too much dryness too much drought too much dust don't cover the fertile land with dust right now you know that type of approach so this was geb g-e-b so keeping that in mind the lord said to moses verse 16 tell aaron said stretch out your staff and strike the dust to the ground and throughout the land of egypt the dust will become gnats they did this and when aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground gnats came up on the men and the animals all the dust throughout the land of egypt became gnats when the magicians tried to produce produce gnats by their secret arts they could not that's a turning point in the approach that the uh court of pharaoh took to the plagues the magician said to pharaoh this is the finger of god but pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen just as the lord had said well, let's think about that for a minute i remember many years ago when i was about 17 i was on a backpacking hiking trip and it was unusually hot middle of summer and of course despite thinking i was in shape i was not for that kind of hiking and going up a mountain i remember distinctly breathing like this mouth open you know gasping for breath and a fly buzzy in my mouth and immediately oh. swallowed it and so we you know and it's funny to me that decades later I still remember that feeling of having that bug go right down my throat, despite the fact I didn't want that, you know? And thinking about gnats everywhere, you know, you know how weird it is to be out walking and you suddenly see this kind of uh, cloud of gnats and you want to do anything you can to avoid and you kind of wave your hand thinking, oh, I'm sure this will make a difference. And, and, you know, those gnats just get all over you, get everywhere. And of course, you know, whether that's gnat or flea or uh, some other bug, a mite of some sort, you know, most all of us have chigger bites at some time or another, miserable. You know, I'm, if I'm you... Says lice. lice, interesting. You know how hard lice is to get rid of, you know, you basically have to like burn the hair off your head and, <laughs> and slop, slop on mayonnaise and then do, do that every day for the rest of your life and hope to get rid of those lice. So, you know, either way, whatever this little critter was, and I've always pictured kind of a mite, which is what a, a, what a louse is. Um, you know, I think they just dig in everywhere and annoy you like crazy. And of course, what comes with that? But you itch like crazy. And if you've ever itched like crazy, you know there's almost no way back to sanity from that. So it is, this was a significantly difficult plague. And what's really interesting to me is the magicians just couldn't reproduce it. And I'm guessing it's because they were covered in ants, you know, <laughs> how, or lice or whatever it was. How do you reproduce something when you can't hide it first? You know, if you could sweep frogs out of the way and then say, look, there's one, and claim you put it there, that's a little different than if you're swarmed over with these uh, mites. And so I think that's really interesting and very fascinating that he said, this is the finger of God. I think that's just a uh, remarkable statement. And there are a few other statements in scripture about the finger of God, including Jesus talking about the finger of God. And um, I think I just think that's a powerful statement of how this uh, plague went. So I'm going to introduce the next false god. We don't have time to get through it. This is Capri, K-H-E-P-R-I who was uh, presumed to be the god of creation, the movement of the sun, and the rebirth found in the, uh, the day. So that's a little bit awkward to say that they're talking about flies, but except that the, the uh, manifestation in art form and hieroglyphics of Capri, anybody want to guess what it is? Fly? It's a fly, yeah. <laughs> it's the head of a fly on the body of a man. And so what was thought to be was that because the fly has this multifaceted eye set at the top of the head, that the fly could watch the sun from uh, dawn to dusk. And that they, the fly always had a view of the sun that way. And therefore represent what the sun meant to the people. I think I saw that movie. It was in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, Jeff Goldblum was yeah, that his name was Capri, possibly 
reincarnated, but but I don't believe in re reincarnation, so I won't mention that. But the uh, anyway, then the Lord said to Moses, his first twenty, chapter eight of Exodus, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh as he goes to the water, and say to him, "This is what the Lord says: Let my people go, so they may worship me. If you do not, let my people go. I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies." and even the ground where they are. Okay, I'm gonna stop there in the interest of time so we put just to say, can you imagine having just had, whether it's lice, mites, uh, fleas, gnats, chiggers, whatever, all over you and you're already miserable and you've already been itching like crazy. What happens when you scratch like crazy? You bleed, right? What are flies generally attracted to to lay their larvae? blood and so it's interesting to me that this was the immediate follow-up to the self-imposed wounds of the people probably from the scratching and the misery of that and right after the misery of that come these flies to just stick all over you and i can't imagine the misery there if we have one fly in the house which is rare because they're usually more but if we have <laughs> one fly in the house you know we all want to go find a fly swatter and kill the thing yeah, i mean it's amazing how often it's buzzing right in your face and you know, it, I can't imagine just being swarmed all over with that. So with that thought, we'll carry on there next week. Thank you for all the comments as always, and uh, have a blessed week.